Until you're experiencing pain, you're not looking for a solution. We need inflation in every currency. And it has to be really bad and people have to suffer a lot before we get the mainstream to adopt Bitcoin. Bitcoin, probably six out of seven times, is portrayed as a scam. We don't just go in front of somebody and say, hey, let me tell you about Bitcoin and why it's valuable because they haven't been prepped yet. They're not ready for that piece of, of information. They're so busy trying to survive. They don't even have the time to stop and think, what is the problem? Why is this happening? Happening, does it have to be happening right now? I don't think any college student is under any illusion that they can graduate college and go buy a house like their grandparents did. They're under no such illusion. They know that they have a very tough road in front of them. My eyes were here, but it wasn't until I went into the Bitcoin space where I was just like zoomed down like, oh, I understand now. And then I just got mad. Money is a mindset in that if you're poor in fiat, you can also be poor hodling a lot of Bitcoin. What do you think is the most important aspect of, of Bitcoin education? The most important aspect of Bitcoin education is to realize that there are many steps in a person's journey before Bitcoin would make sense to them. So for those people who already come looking for solutions and they find Bitcoin, they slip down the rabbit hole really fast because they've been prepped like all the the little checks have happened already. We just weren't a part of that. So if we're trying to orange pill people, it's important that we don't just go in front of somebody and say, hey, let me tell you about Bitcoin, why it's valuable, because they haven't been prepped yet. They're not ready for that piece of, of information. First, you have to gauge where they are in their awareness of whether or not there's a problem with our monetary system and what's going on, because a lot of people are not even aware that there's a problem. They sort of you know, put their head down and you're just going through the daily grind of making ends meet. You know, do I need a second job? Do I need to budget my food and instead of eating, you know, beef, I'm going to eat just eggs or something like that, you know? So they're so busy trying to survive. They don't even have the time to stop and think, what is the problem? Why is this happening? Does it have to be happening right now? They kind of accept it. And then they just do their best to deal with it. I've come across a lot of college students who are exactly in that mindset because, you know, Scott and I, we, of course, really care about the next, uh, the next generation, which is why our company is named Free Market Kids. And so we've done a lot of, we've had a lot of conversations with college kids and we just think, you know, for sure they're so ready because they know that um, there's a problem. I don't think any college student is under any illusion that they can graduate college and go buy a house like their grandparents did. They're under no such illusion. They know that they have a very tough road in front of them. But if you ask them, well, why is that happening? Do you think it should be happening? A hundred percent of the people I spoke to just said, well, it's, that's just the way it is. And we just have to live with it. We just have to make the best of it. And so when we're talking about Bitcoin education, I think it's just important that we realize that there, there are different steps and we like which part of that that progress do you want to target? Because you can't do all of it. There are I think we we are very heavy on the, you know, the step where they're right in front of the Bitcoin rabbit hole and you're just kind of pushing them to go down. But but you, there are some breadcrumbs that we need to work on. And and I think that's that's one of the things that I really want to get the message out is First, you got to prep the customer <laughs> so that they're ready for that purchasing um, decision. And the prep is, I think, where we need to um, have some more work in the Bitcoin space. How does this prep work? I feel like a lot of like, there's this concept in marketing that you have to see something like seven times or nine times, like different studies shows different things be right. before we buy something or before we take a decision. Um, is it just like using Bitcoin <laughs> randomly and in conversations and just uh, getting the name out there or the, the idea of, of, of free market and the idea of, of sound money or how do you, how do you see that uh, laying the, the preparation work for, for getting in the rabbit hole? Yeah, so I think awareness is number one. If you think marketing, you have awareness um, and then you have people who have tried something, you know, they're aware and they've tried some stuff. And then you have people who are aware, they've tried some stuff and all the stuff have failed. And then you offer a solution. That's, you know, of the three groups of cus potential customers, you want to target the ones that are aware of the problem, have tried stuff, 
have failed and now they are very frustrated, just desperate for a solution. Those are the ones that are ready to buy your idea, right? And so I think the awareness part is where we're missing it because if we, if I go up to you, let's say, right, and um, and you're you're brought up in the Christian household and your family life was happy, your community supportive, and I come to you and say, hey, everything you've been told is wrong. Actually, Christianity is wrong. You're going to be like, get out of here. Why are you talking, you know, talking to me about this? But let's say you, you were brought up in the Christian church and your family was abusive and your church was really messed up. And I come to you and go, Hey, something's wrong with the Christianity beliefs. Um, maybe you should consider something else. Then you'll be like, yeah, tell me what you have to say. So it just, you know, that awareness level. So if you go to someone who, you know, has a pretty nice nest egg. Right. They're, they're feeling pretty good. Their job has been secure. They haven't gone through, luckily, they haven't gone through any layoffs. And you go up to them and go, you know, there's something really wrong with the monetary system. They're going to be like, what? It's fine. I'm fine. What is your problem? You know, get out of here. So that awareness piece, I think, is where we need to start spreading the breadcrumbs, which is why um, before we started recording, I mentioned that I want to get to an audience as young as possible. And um, so I'll just use another example. When my kids were really little, my oldest was only four. I was talking to a friend of mine and she said, have you talked to your daughter about sex? And I said, why on earth would I want to talk to my four-year-old about sex? And she said, well, you want to be the first in front of her discussing what it is and should be and self-respect and things like that, because you don't know where they're going to get that information. And once the seed has been planted, now you're fighting an uphill battle to dissuade them from their first belief. So you want to be the first one exposing them to the idea that your body is to be respected. It is not to be flung around or whatever. And so she told me when my daughter was four years old, that I should start with sex education. Now, of course, we don't go into details. We just kind of very, very like high level talk about how it's about love. It's about two committed people, that kind of stuff. That's it. That's all we talk about, but you're planting little seeds. And then when they turn six, there's a follow-up book. And then you talk a little bit deeper about that. And then when they turn eight, it's another book, a little bit longer, a little bit more details. When they're 10, you've been laying the groundwork. And then you say, hey, um, in this case, in the Christian community, of course, we believe that, you know, you you should um, respect your body like a like a living temple, right? And so you kind of get into the full message of it, but you don't wait until they're 10 years old to give them the full message. And so the Super K Adventures, which I was telling you about, is my effort to reach the youngest population and get in front of them and start planting the seeds. So of course, we're not going to be like, hey, guess what? The government is printing money and uh, your savings in the piggy bank uh, five years from now, it's going to be worth nothing. You don't want to say that to a little kid, right? But it is happening and we can tell them very high level. And so the books that I'm writing are number one, supposed to be fun, just, just a fun kid book. And then number two, you just like, just kind of drop a little breadcrumb just in there. So the first book is just addressing the issue of inflation, which I think little kids would pick up here and there from parents saying, oh, this is so expensive. Um, the price of eggs are going up. The price of milk is going up, that kind of thing. But that doesn't translate to their personal pain. You know, you, until you're experiencing pain, you're not looking for a solution. And so for the, for the first book, the way that I'm kind of spreading this, the, the cookie crumbs, I call it, is um, so this little boy, his name is Kay. He's seven years old. He makes a mistake. He breaks his mom's face. And I don't have him bailed out by just saying, I'm sorry. I don't have him bailed out by the parents going, you know, we'll just replace it. And then you just have to never do it again because there are consequences in life. If you break something as an adult, you have to pay for it. So we, so in the book, I don't bail him out. And so he turns into his alter ego. He puts on a cape. He's like, I'm super K and I can solve this problem. So he works really hard. He's doing chores. He's saving up money. And then he goes to the flower shop and the price has increased. He's saving up $10. <laughs> he gets to the flower shop. The price has gone up to 15. And that's a reality that we all face every day. But for a child to make it very real and very personal and make a mark so that you're planting that seed, it has to fit their life circumstance and what they understand, what they relate to. So that's the way that I see um, that awareness 
at least that's one one aspect of doing it is just to start planting seeds. Now for adults, it, the awareness part has to come even less directly because like I said, if if everything we have known has brought us here and I'm not currently experiencing extreme pain, there's no reason for me to hear about something alternative like Bitcoin. I mean, it's so it's so abstract to at least people my generation and older and maybe even a few generations, like one generation <laughs> following me. Um, it's just such a foreign concept, the, the whole digital currency thing. And so, I don't know, that's just the way I see education that I feel like just needs a little bit more fleshing out in the Bitcoin community. It's interesting when you uh, talk about inflation. Uh, I... I'm not out a lot. I'm mostly in my studio and recording podcasts, but sometimes I go out and sometimes I listen to other people that are completely, that are completely strangers to me. Uh, and I just like sit in the, in the U-Bane or sit some, somewhere where I can listen to people that talk to each other, but don't have any relation to me. And it's fascinating how often inflation comes up in a direct or indirect way where they're like, oh, wow. Like I was, um, uh, the other day, I have this thing where sometimes I, I buy a McFlurry late in the night uh, from a girlfriend or something like that. So I, I, I don't go off and do McDonald's, but sometimes I do as like a small treat. Uh, and I was go there and there was someone ordering and I was like, what? That's now four euros? And I hear that more and more. Like I was last time in a train uh, and there was like two older men uh, sitting like I think around 60 or 70 years old. And they were basically discussing how everything got more expensive like for two hours straight i was i was like i was really <laughs> close to for like they just like putting a camera there because it was so lovely their talk uh, and i think it would be a hit on, on on the internet to just put that out there uh but i feel like inflation the problem is getting more and more mainstream but at the same time i also see that the the level of pain didn't hit uh, 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 and, and really incredible point where people are like, Oh, what do I have to like, what do I have to do? Can I go to Bitcoin? What, what solutions can I get? And then I look at countries where, for example, Turkey or Argentina, there the Bitcoin uh, adoption is also not 50% or 70%. It's higher than in, in other countries and people are more aware and more open to solutions, but they go more towards like a US dollar solution or other stronger field currency solutions. So like it's, it's interesting for me that, that inflation topic, I feel like we, we need inflation in every currency and it has to be really bad and people have to suffer a lot before we, we get the mainstream to, to adopt Bitcoin. Is, is that pain point uh, <laughs> so important in our education? Yeah. So <clears throat> the analogy I like to draw is if somebody's being abused, in a relationship and the scale of abuse, like let's say zero is there is zero abuse. It's the, it's everybody, everybody's loving, they're respectful. And then 10 is where your life is in danger. And you're trying to tell this person to leave the relationship, right? If it's 9.5 and they're almost dead, they're still not going to leave the relationship. They have to get to 10 before they will make that final leap. And I feel like a lot of people are experiencing pain and we might be on the scale of suffering, you know, with from inflation, maybe at a seven or eight, at least in the US or even a five and a six, depending on who you are. And we're still many steps away from us waking up and going, we need to do, we can't, this cannot continue, right? I think a lot of people are complaining because they're feeling pain. I think the danger of us not doing a good job with Bitcoin education is when they get to 10, that's when they're absolutely being led by emotion and they're very easily swayed. So they're not necessarily going to pick the best option. You're just going to pick the available option. So if we're not in front of them already saying Bitcoin is the safest way or alternative to fiat money, then they're going to see crypto and go, oh, that's okay too. They're going to see CBDC and go, oh, that's even better because that's secure. The government is going to protect me, obviously. And um, and so we, like 
our job, I think, as Bitcoin educators is we have to do, we have to understand that this is a marketing process. And if we are not in front of their eyeballs, you know how they say, you, like what you're saying before, you have to be in front of them seven times before they buy something. Well, that's if they see it favorably seven times. Bitcoin, probably six out of seven times, is portrayed as a scam. So that's not working in our favor. So if they get to 10 and what they see is CBDC, that's what they're going to go for. And so also the, the idea of inflation, there's so much mixed um, ideas that are presented to them with a lot of money behind them that inflation is being caused by something other than money printing. It is the politician, it is his policy, it is the corporations are being greedy. Um, it is everybody else's fault except the fact that money is being printed, right? So that's the challenge that we have. We have to lay the groundwork. Then we also have to be the first thing they see, you know, in a positive light so that they can choose that when they're at the heightened, like 10, you know, like I have to make a difference. I have to make a different choice now. And if we're not right in front of them, when they are in that emotional moment, they're going to choose something else. Oh, that's why you also say that we have to make Bitcoin more family friendly. I think you mm -hmm. wrote even an article around that uh, yeah. and to get them as as early as as, as possible uh, to get like a, a favorable or like a, a good association to Bitcoin. Like that's really, uh, I, I love that a lot what you're doing. Yeah. And the other thing is also I have like, there are three audiences I'm trying to reach with my pre, my uh, early reader series, right? So you have, I, I don't talk about money and I don't talk about Bitcoin specifically in the book. So my goal is to be able to to share this book with any parent who wants to read a nice, cute little sweet story with their kid, right? So they're reading the the story to the kid. So the kid, we're, we're putting group breadcrumbs in front of the kid, but the mom is reading it and she's gathering information too. So she's seeing that if her child saved up for something, like we used to have to do, if you want a bike, you saved up for a bike. If you want it, you know, like a computer Playboy thing, um, you save up for it. But if they save up, they have integrity. They're not swiping it on your credit card. They said, we are going to work toward this goal. And the goal keeps moving. That pain, the mom is going to feel on behalf of the child. So in that way, we're raising awareness, you know, of the issues in front of the mom as well. And also how many grandparents are involved in reading stories to their children, their grandchildren a lot. Right. So we're also indirectly influencing the grandparents because they remember a day when they saved up for a bike, the money they saved up, that was their goal, was enough to go to the store and buy the bike. But it's not that way now. You don't know how much the bike would be by the time you go to the store today. It's also interesting, uh, the the mom has a really central role in Orange Building the Next Generation because um, usually, uh, the mom, like I am like 25, I have no experience and I have no clue at all, but from my subjective feeling, I feel like the mom has a better connection usually with the kids. Uh, and, uh, I feel like that could be a really crucial role in, in, in educating the new generation. Um, and then you look at the Bitcoin events and they're like 90% guys, uh, and, and there's like maybe 10% women. Uh, it's into, like, I have around five to 10% of my audience is, is women. It depends on which month, uh, uh funny enough, it, it, it's volatile quite, quite, uh, quite, uh, massively. Uh, then I think the big, I, I mentioned that so many times, Natalie Brunel is, uh, the, probably the biggest female Bitcoin podcaster in the scene, uh, with the biggest audience, audience at least. And f she posted something with 20% of a female audience, uh, which is also not too high. Um, I think you wrote an article around the topic actually with, um, what was it? How to approach, uh, uh, how to have a different approach to Bitcoin education for women, something like that. What's your thoughts around that? Yes. Yeah, so women. Well, so I think in the article, I said, number one, you have to anger mama bear. You, have, <laughs> you, it's, it's all about the kids. When I, when my kids were little, if you came to me and try to tell me anything that had nothing directly related to the well-being of my children, I'm sorry. I don't have time for you. 
because my days are busy. My 24 hours a day, you know, I could be dealing with a sick child and another child who is having trouble with math and another child who's having trouble with her friends. My emotional bandwidth is like this big, you know, I'm, and also I homeschool. So, so that, that made my job like 24 seven, literally, you know, 365. And, um, and if you said anything to me that wasn't directly related to the well being of my kids, just don't even talk to me. I don't have time for you. And that's just, that's just practicality. That's just, I have 24 hours in a day, right? So if we're trying to reach moms and we're saying, Hey, go listen to this podcast that's two hours long, unless she is really realizing that there is a problem, like what I was saying about the journey of a customer for an idea, unless you're at a 10, they're not going to give you the time of day. But if you drop little breadcrumbs, they can pick it up, you know, and which is why even, okay, I'll just give you another personal example is when my kids were little, I was very intentional about teaching them about economics because Scott and I, we both have an MBA and we both felt that we grew up not really understanding how money worked. Even through the MBA program, we didn't feel like we got the education that we really needed to understand how the system works. So we were really intentional. And only for that reason did I go into the economics books and we actually even created a game to teach economics to our kids. Um, but if you go to any of my friends, the homeschooling moms, and you said, hey, don't you think that it would be really important for your child's future to teach them about money? They're going to say yes. However, here's a priority list of their daily to do's, right? You have, of course, you feed your children, you clothe them, you get them different places. And then you have the traditional three R's. You have the reading, writing, arithmetic. Then you have, if you're a Christian, it's going to be religion. And then you're going to have science, obviously. And then you have everything else. And then money is right on the bottom because these are all priority, priority number one, I guess these are all like this. So nobody's going to say money is not important, but they don't have the bandwidth. And if we say, Hey, let me tell you about the history of money. Like, you know, some people, some people think in order to make information by size, we just take a textbook and you just chop it into short chapters and that's by size information. And, and that's the way you're going to reach these busy people. And I'm specifically talking about busy moms. So if you told me, hey, instead of reading a book, how about reading a chapter on money? I'm still going to say, no, thanks. I Why would I want to read about the history of money? It's irrelevant to my kid who has a toothache. It's irrelevant to my kid who is struggling with the algebra, you know? But if you say, hey, let us let me tell you about a story, and it's a story that you can enjoy with your family as a whole, everybody's benefiting from that time, and the breadcrumb is there they'll pick it up because we're all intelligent human beings. We'll pick it up. The kids will pick it up and it will build. It's a compound effect. So in that way, I feel like you, we just have to be aware of our audience. Women have a different emotional priority. It is not just, do they have time or not? Do they have time? Yes. They might choose to scroll on their phone because that's the only way they can sh turn everything off because you're thinking all the time. You're, if you think about women, we have and a computer, we have a lot of windows open at the same time. So when we're focused on even scrolling on Instagram and looking at puppy videos or something, that's our way of, of just ignoring all these open windows for that moment of time. Why would we think that they would care about reading a paragraph about money? They're not because that's more thinking. And I again, there it's about emotional bandwidth and knowing your audience. It's so important uh, to get there. Really, really cool how you describe it. Um, you also mentioned homeschooling and I feel like homeschooling and Bitcoin is such, an, <laughs> such a topic that just sticks together. Like I feel like everyone in, in Bitcoin is either trying to or, uh, homeschool uh, or is already homeschooling, uh, at least those who have the possibilities. Uh, you also need the, the time and uh, the resources to do, it, do that. Uh, you, you're homeschooling, uh, right? And and you also big on homeschooling. I homeschooled my kids. Are I'm all done. That's the only reason I'm working in the Bitcoin space now. If if they weren't done, I, you would not be seeing me. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's that's. They clear. are my priority always. 
How, how is homeschooling uh, going? I, I think I was not homeschooled uh, in Austria. I don't know anyone uh, that homeschools their kids, but everyone that I speak to online and is a Bitcoiner and, and has kids, they seemingly all homeschool. Uh, why, why is homeschooling uh, the better way? Oh, there. That's a that's a very big topic. Um, I'll give you my personal reason for why I decided to homeschool my kids pre Bitcoin days because I I didn't get into Bitcoin until the tail end of my homeschooling days. So the reason I started it was um, I did it. Okay, several reasons. One, I don't want my kids graded while they're learning. I think that's counterproductive. When they are learning, they should be making mistakes. And if we're grading them, then you are really punishing them. I don't care what people say about feedback. If you're keeping that grade and then averaging it out at the end of the school year and the student is labeled as an A student, B student, or C student, it is a punitive feedback. So I don't believe in grading when they're learning. If you're trying to check if they have mastered something, then you grade. So that's one. Number two, I don't believe in all subjects advancing at the same speed. I think some kids are naturally inclined to understand arithmetic. Some kids are naturally inclined to understand uh, language arts, some in, you know, like expressive art, some in athletic, it doesn't matter. But I don't believe that all these different areas of knowledge need to happen in the same trajectory in the same time. And so if I have a child who's like a very advanced reader, I don't, and she's, you know, technically fourth grade age or whatever, I don't want to keep her reading at fourth grade. And I think reading by grade age is It's so ridiculous anyway, because I think kids will pick up what they can pick up if you speak to them normally. If you use expressive and beautiful language, they will pick up what they can pick up and that will build. You, as a teacher, if you assume that you can, they can only understand sentences that are less than 10 words long, then you rob them the opportunity to learn better, you know, because you have drawn a box around where they can grow. So anyway, I don't believe in unilateral advancement progress, I guess. That's my own word. <laughs> um, the other thing is also, I really want it um, if a child is struggling in one particular area for him to not advance until that that particular area has been mastered. So if you, in the, in a, classroom situation, if you pass a test and let's say you're the passing grade is 65 and you get 66 and you pass, that gap between 66 and 100, that's going to prevent you from being successful in the next level of, let's say, arithmetic, right? Because it's a, you build up on the previous knowledge and you slowly advance forward. If you have trouble with addition, and you pass it, you barely scrape by, you pass it, you go to multiplication, you're going to suffer a lot because your foundation wasn't built right. But they have to continually move you forward. But in homeschooling, you have the option to say, hey, if you have a master edition, let's try something else. Maybe it's a different approach. Maybe it's different. Maybe you need to add tactile stuff. Maybe you need to be jumping up and down. So you're a kinetic learner. And so maybe you need to say the addition table by, by jumping on a trampoline. I don't know. Um, maybe you need to be running in place, but you don't go forward until you have mastered this so that at the next level, you have all the tools that you need to build on your knowledge base. So when you're homeschooling, you have the freedom to do that in a classroom situation when the teacher has to, um, you know, teach 35 kids at a time, they can't possibly do that. So you just keep getting moved forward. And if the knowledge gap continues to widen, you're going to have a child who eventually really, really struggles. And then the thing is also you get labeled so quickly in the school system. You're labeled by your grade. You're labeled by the classes you take. You're labeled by maybe the clothes you wear. The labels distract you from the actual learning process. So when you're homeschooling, even if that's the only um, advantage that you see is the lack of labeling your child while he is just trying to figure out who he is and you know what this life is about and how to be successful. That right there, just that one little difference 
I think would make the experience worth it. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin, keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox. And if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup, your security setup, and maybe even your citizenship set up, you have to talk to the Bitcoin way. If you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin, you get a 30-minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made a perfect Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin. Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. The labels one is a big one. I feel like in, in Austria, I don't know if it's uh, around the world also like that, but in Austria, they are like uh, different within a class, different uh, stages. So if you're in stage one, you are in the high class. And, and if you're in stage three, you are struggling with, with that topic. And they have different tests for different stages. So you're not even in like, you're in a, in, in a separate class, but in that class, there's a further division, uh, like a class is like that. That's, that's so ridiculous right now to me. Uh, but back then as a child, you know, it was normal. It was like you accepted it. You didn't uh, question it. N no parent questioned that, like at least not to my knowledge. Uh, and, and right now I'm like, they, they put the kids like in different, uh, in different classes that they divided, like th th those labels, they can really hunt you down. Like, I think that's, that, that does something to a, to a kid and it, it's, uh, it's not good for sure. Like I 100% uh, agree with you here. It's, it's, it's a hard one. Uh, yeah. And whatever they get labeled when they're in first grade, um, it, it, you carry that with you unless you're very, very, very intentional later on life to counteract that. It's sitting in the back of your mind always. And I read, uh, it was a book called The Outliers and they were talking about how, um, in, when you go into a gray system, you have kids coming in with different birthdays, right? But if they fall in the same calendar year, they go into the same school year. So for example, when you're, when you're entering, let's say kindergarten, um, so the age range can be five to six. So somebody's born in January 1st versus somebody's born December 31st, they all go in as kindergartners. Now we all know when the kids are young, one year makes a huge difference in their ability to do things. So you're all entering kindergarten, but a child could be almost a year older than another child. So let's say the child who's lucky enough to be born January 1st goes in kin kindergarten and he just excels at everything because they have to accommodate for the average, right? So the one that's born December 31st now is looking kind of like, oh, he's uh, maybe a little slow. You know, maybe he's a little behind. And then kids can feel that. They know. They go into... They go into first grade. Again, the January 1st child is going to be able to do a lot more stuff than the December 31st child, right? And then if you think about the accumulating effect of that going through the schools, 
if the younger child is lucky enough to have a lot of support at home or just is naturally inclined that subject, then they might be okay. But just think about the disadvantage you put these kids in, even just by their birthday and by their physical development. And you can avoid that with homeschooling. I love that a lot. Yeah. Homeschooling is, uh, I think it's further down the line for me, uh, hopefully a few, 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 few more years. Uh, but it's something that I highly um, see now. And if I even look it up in Austria, I think it's possible. Uh, I, ne I don't know anyone. That's why I'm not sure. But uh, what I looked up, it's possible. Germany, I know it's not possible as far as I know. Uh, but yeah. Why did you, uh, it's a question that I should have asked way earlier, but why did you uh, got Bitcoin? Why, what made it click for you? What, what, what was the pain point or the, the advantage <laughs> trigger point for, for you? Okay. I, first I have to say, um, my husband dragged me into it against my will. <laughs> uh, it, like I said, we came across Bitcoin in, in, in a more uh, serious way at the tail end of my homeschooling career with my kids. And at the time I was graduating four kids at a time because we did the one school room setup. And so when my oldest started high school, my youngest just kind of just did what she did. And so he, he was many years more advanced. Um, so I was trying to graduate them. And in the U S the college application process for a homeschooling family is very, very involved because they don't believe anything you say as a parent, they want third party acknowledgement for everything. And so I was, instead of saying, here's the transcript transcript of the classes they took, uh, you, I had to provide the curriculum. I had to provide their assignments. I have to provide information on how I graded. It was this, it's like this whole giant book that I had to submit to the college uh, admission office for each child. And so it was a very, very busy time for me. And that was around the same time that Scott uh, was starting to hear more and more podcasters that he was listening to talk about Bitcoin. So he came to me one day and he said, Hey, you know, this Bitcoin thing, I think, I think it's real and we should look into it for the sake of our kids. We should understand it. And that would he he knows my trigger words, right? For the sake of the kids. Because he didn't say that. I'm just like, get out of here. I don't have time. <laughs> um, but he said, for the sake of the kids. I'm like, oh. and then he said, um, he said, here's a book. It's the Bitcoin Standard, which is really thick, as you know. Um, here are, you know, 10 two hour long podcasts you should listen to about, you know, the history of money and the development of money and Bitcoin and stuff. Um, here's some articles. They're all very long for whatever reason. And uh, here's some videos. And I literally just would look at them and go, you know what? I just don't have the mental bandwidth for this. Why are you bugging me? Can you just leave me alone? And he kept just going after it. He's like, you need, we need to understand this as a family. The kids need to understand this. This is the development of the financial technology. And finally, he uh, he just said, okay, let me just try to explain it to you on the table. So he took some Mahjong tiles and some playing cards and he just marked up stuff and he was trying to demonstrate the blockchain transaction. He was trying to explain SHA-256, how the math goes only one direction, not the other direction, et cetera. And he was like, don't you understand now it is so crystal clear? And I said, no. Like, <laughs> so he continued to work on that. Um, it took two years. For him to convince me to read the first book <laughs> in Bitcoin. In the meantime, he created the game Huddle Up, uh, which is the flagship game that we have for every market kids. But anyway, it wasn't until I was absolutely convinced that digital currency could be a thing, an actual legitimate thing that might replace the dollar because you cannot copy it. That I was like, fine, give me one of your, your um, Bitcoin books. I will read one book. And I, it, I listened to it on Audible. It was um, Bitcoin, Hard Money, You Can't Have With by Jason Williams. And I listened to it on 2X because I was like, that's how much time I'm giving you. I think the book is like five hours. And I was like, I will give you two and a half hours. And from the first chapter, I, like, I just felt like my eyes opened. And the reason, getting back to your question about the sort of the journey that I was already on to be ready to listen to, to the explanation was, um, so Scott and I both graduated from, from Yale. We both have an MBA degree and I chose to stay home. I was supposed to go into investment banking and I held my baby and I'm like, no, I don't want somebody else raising my child. I want to be the one to be the primary caretaker. 
I care about having a really good relationship with her. So I chose to stay home. And Scott and I both had huge student loans. And I told him, like, you're it. You're going to have to take on both student loans and pay it down. And it's as big as a mortgage. I mean, it's huge. And um, so we have four kids really close. And he was working a job. But even then, I think it was 2000. It was 2001 when the first wave started to hit and his um, his job offer was pulled right out of business school. It was pulled. And we're like, what is happening? We thought that if we worked really hard, we got into good schools, we got good grades, we got a good internship, it, our future was going to be set. But it, so his job offer was pulled in 2001 and we started looking at each other like, what is going on? In 2008, um, the first financial crisis, the major, major financial crisis happened. And we lived in a town and he worked for a company where they laid off 40,000 people in the same area. And we were one of them. And they were like, and you know, we have like the Wall Street protests and and um a lot of news articles coming out saying opposite things, and I couldn't make sense of it. We both desperately wanted to understand why it was happening so we could explain it to our kids. Like I said before, I was very intentional about teaching them about economics so they can make life choices that are informed and not based on sound bites and you know, like propaganda or whatever. I wanted them to be intellectually informed on why things happen, why things are the way they are. But I couldn't figure it out in 2008. And at that time, we have four little kids and Scott was laid off. And then again, it happened. If I think it was like 2011. And so when I, so so that was like, I was already struggling with that idea. Number one, the fact that we would struggle so much because we were, trying to pay down two student loans. And I chose to stay home, which was a huge controversy with our family. (laughs) Cause uh, you know, the expectation is you get a good education, you work, you know, you, you put your kids in childcare and you work and you get, you know, ROI from your investment in your education. But, but just looking back the, the last, you know, 25 years of our marriage and everything that we've gone through since we graduated from the business school Looking at the money system through the lens of Bitcoiners finally explained why all those things were happening. And we were already frustrated because we couldn't figure out the right way to explain it to our kids to give them a better chance for a bright future, et cetera, et cetera. And um, and so that that was basically, I think, life experiences prepped me for that message because I was already confused and looking for answers. And I didn't have the right framework until we zoomed way back out because I was still looking at like the financial institution in terms of, you know, jobs and corporations. And, you know, is it, is it our tax policy? Is it, is it just um, people like corporations are um, just cold and all about numbers? Like I was, my eyes were here, but it wasn't until I went into the Bitcoin space where I was just like zoomed down, like, oh, I understand now. And then I just got mad. <laughs> I just got mad. And I it. I had to stop my book several times, but I was straight down the rabbit hole. And I was like, everybody, everybody needs to understand this. Everybody needs to understand this. But we have to be so strategic because if you came to me even 10 years ago and tried to tell me about Bitcoin, I would not have listened to you. Uh, it's, 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 it's very true. A really cool story, by the way. Um, how, how many b- Bitcoin books did you now read uh, from, from the first one onwards? How, how deep was the rabbit hole? A lot, a lot. Not as many as Scott. Like every Bitcoin book that comes out, we have a copy of. And he, <laughs> he reads all of them. <clears throat> he listens to every podcast. I still feel like there are there's more to life that I'm interested in and want to continue learning about. So my sole focus with our business is Bitcoin, but, but we live in this physical existence, right? So like, I think you said, you mentioned that um, in one of the previous podcasts you did with other guests, like, I think it was the one with Terrence, uh, you were talking about politics because Bitcoin is a really cool tool. It's a cool idea and it would be great when we get to the point where Bitcoin is the new money standard, but we live in this moment and there's still a gap between where we are and where we all hope we're going to get to. So 
life is very big. Life still involves a lot more than just money concepts, you know? And so, yeah, I have read a lot of books, but I, I definitely don't deep dive the way that Scott does. It's interesting also, if, uh, I mentioned, I just uh, realized that like, I think a month ago or one and a half months ago, something like that, where I have a Bitcoin podcast and just imagine I would have not a Bitcoin podcast, but like a stock podcast. On a stock podcast, you probably just talk about stocks and how to pick like good management teams and, and, and stuff like that and what a P ratio is and all those things. Um, and then now I have a Bitcoin podcast. I did, for example, with, with Lisa Huff, a complete episode just around parenting. Like that, that, that was like only that topic we talked, like we had, we probably name dropped Bitcoin like five times in that podcast in like one and a half hours. Uh, so Bitcoin is that weird financial topic where we, you can talk about parenting and homeschooling and diet and uh, carnivore versus vegan and all those interesting topics that yeah. come from a sound mind and then all of a sudden you can go through all these topics and the viewers actually like that. Like the when I make an episode, completely off topic it's not like oh only like one percent listens to that no like they they like it they love it they, they see the 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 change in it the mix in it i think the other side is actually true like if if i only have on topic hardcore bitcoin topics i think people would be bored with that so i i, I love getting in like homeschooling in, in 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 an episode or even make a whole episode around fiat food and what's wrong with our food supply it yeah. is a little bit of a Bitcoin topic, but when we're honest, it's not really a Bitcoin topic. It's it's around our, our food system and why it's it's bad. So there's a it's really interesting how we can go with Bitcoin in so many different topics, and we don't only have to talk about money. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Really, really cool. Yeah. Perfect. Then uh, before we get to the end routine, um, we mentioned it a little bit. Free markets, kids, orange headers, super K Avengers. Um, how does this all fit together? What are you doing in, in Bitcoin and, and what is that? Okay. So Free Market Kids is um, the company that Scott and I created to use board games to teach money concepts without using lectures. So I always I always prefer that um, that lessons are derived from experience because that's how it's most meaningful to the student. Right. So the first game that we created for for Mary Kids actually was pre coiner days. We were just finding a we were looking for a way to teach economic principles, how price moves with changes in supply and demand to our kids without just using a video lecture and then quiz sheets. Because that's if you look um I don't know about today, but back then, um, if you're teaching economics, it's immediately Books, long books, lectures, and then quizzing the kids. And then you go into graphs and you do equations and calculations, which is great for academics. But for the purpose that I had in mind at the time when we developed this was when Trump was going through his first election run. And I remember him saying, uh, making a statement that he was going to increase tariffs on Chinese imports because of the, the, you know, the, the trade imbalance. Um, and I, I remember seeing these news outlets go on college campuses asking students what they thought about that. And from the answers that the students gave, it was ample clear they had no clue how that one policy will affect them personally. They, it was just, and then another one, it was like, what if, um, what if all student debts were, were, uh, were thrown out? Like it just erased. And of course, all the students on the college campuses are be like, that's great. Of course, college should be free. What they don't realize is nothing is free and there's always a cost and guess who's going to pay for it? <laughs> they don't realize who's going to actually pay for it. They just think it's free. The government's going to pay for it. The government has no money. And so, <clears throat> so we wanted to, we wanted our kids to be informed during the election process, listening to all these sound bites. So we created a negotiation game <clears throat> where the players would, <clears throat> sorry, would um, negotiate a price depending on how many suppliers 
and or how many buyers and sellers were in the negotiation. So for example, if I'm if it's my turn in the game and I say I'm looking to buy uh, gravity boots, is anybody selling gravity boots? Well, if one person's selling, that's a one-on-one -on -one negotiation. The price is probably going to sit somewhere in the middle of his my cost and his willingness to pay. But <clears throat> if you have more people selling, very, very quickly, you figure out that the price will be bid lower versus if you have one seller and multiple buyers, you can, through experience, know that the price will be bid up higher. You don't need to draw a chart you know, with a supply and demand curve and move it up the curve and calculate all the areas underneath the curve. Like none of us relevant. They just need to understand, okay, here, that's how price is determined with changes with supply and demand. But then if we draw a market card and it says, well, what if there's a increased tariff on imports from the country where you're sourcing your gravity boots? Well, suddenly that changes your incentive when you're communicating the sales price, right? As a seller. So through practice in the game itself, the kids learn the lessons and afterwards they can answer confidently. This is what happens versus if you give them a lecture and draw graphs, they're going to be like, uh, they might memorize your answers the, to the questions, but they don't necessarily embody the knowledge. So that's the first game we came up with. Is that the best you can do is the, is the name of the game. And the hollow up is the one that Scott created during the two years when he was trying to convince me to go down the rabbit hole with him. So um, it just covers the fundamentals of the Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem. So 21 million Bitcoin ever. Uh, we go through having events. We have difficulty dial that uh, adjusts the difficulty number according to the algorithm. Uh, we put together transactions. We earn re block rewards and we have the hot and cold wallet and you can steal from the hot, but you can't steal from the cold, that kind of stuff. So very basic things. You can play a game and not give any lecture about Bitcoin whatsoever. And afterwards, if you ask the players about questions about those key ideas that we all Bitcoiners see as the most valuable aspect of Bitcoin, they can answer it for you. They know just through experience. And that's all what you always want to do is fun is number one, lesson is number two. That's icing on the cake. Um, then channel up is the next one that he created. It explains liquidity management on the second layer, because when we started listening to more and more people talk about the importance of having a second layer and, you know, smaller transactions, faster transactions, that cheaper transactions. Um, this, this started like a year and a half ago was when it started to be like at the discussion of every Bitcoin meetup we ever went to. And we travel quite a bit up and down the East coast of uh, the United States. Um, my understanding of the lightning layer was very fuzzy. I didn't understand why they kept talking about the challenge of inbound, outbound liquidity management. Cause I'm like, if it's in the channel, it's in the channel. What is the problem with, you know, which direction it's going. But if you play channel up even one time, it becomes crystal clear. It is so visual. Um, I don't think anybody can walk away from playing channel up and not say, I understand the second layer so much better. So that's channel up. And then BIP39 is just a fun party game. You can use it to explain entropy. Um, you know, the how we can use 12 words to secure our, our cold wallets, but you don't have to. So we basically pulled out 74 animal words from the BIP39 list. And then we have players sit around the table. Everybody has the same set of cards and you have one Oracle who pulls out three cards and put them in a certain order. And it's up to the players to ask questions, to eliminate choices and um, figure out what those three cards are and then put them in the right order. And you, it's a race against other players. You want to be the first one to guess. So we're demonstrating entropy, but you don't have to go into it. It's just a fun game. And it's a way for you to talk about Bitcoin without lecturing people about Bitcoin. And that's always the goal is if you, I, and I don't know about your personal experience, but when I go up to someone who's not a Bitcoiner, who didn't come to our Bitcoin meetup and ready for some answers, if you just go up to a random person and, hey, can I talk to you about Bitcoin? They're going to be like, why? You know, like, it's a scam. Uh, why are you telling me? I don't want to hear it. And especially with our family and, and friends, if you say, hey, can I tell you about Bitcoin? They're going to be like, no, thanks. <laughs> Or they're going to roll their eyes at you if they're polite. They're just going to be silently rolling their eyes at you like, oh, my God, here comes a lecture, right? But if you have a bridge to bring them into the space without the lecture, without the in-your-face, let me tell you about Bitcoin, um, 
you just say, hey, come over. Let's have a game night. I'll make some popcorn and we'll just have a lot of fun. And if they are paying attention because they want to win the game, they will ask you questions. And when they ask and then you answer, they will listen to you. So it's, it's, it's kind of, um, I see it that way 100% because when, when you go out and try to get people in Bitcoin, you will fail. Like people, yeah. pe people will not come to, to Bitcoin just because you say like, you have to be really good in sales, uh, to convince someone on the spot, uh, to, to get into Bitcoin and you have to know him good. Like maybe you are his husband. Uh, her husband like maybe maybe there's some some deeper connection then you can do it <laughs> as with you with over two years of of convincing um yeah. as i do it everyone knows that i'm this bitcoin guy and i have a bitcoin podcast and i work fully in bitcoin so i don't have to introduce a topic because i'm my it's it's written on my head bitcoin <laughs> <laughs> like it's, if i'm in a social situation if i'm a, in a family situation if there's someone new coming Uh, the family members explain to them, oh, I'm this Bitcoin guy. <laughs> they, I never have to bring it up. Everyone around me brings Bitcoin up because of my sheer existence in the room, because I'm so vocal about Bitcoin, uh, it, especially online. So which that means is every time Bitcoin comes up, it's not coming up from me. And I'm, I'm 100% silent till someone speaks to me about it. Like I'm not bringing up Bitcoin because I know it's completely pointless. I tried that strategy. I'm not good in, in that. Uh, and so when 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 I know there's Bitcoin de uh, debate, I'm just waiting on, and see what they're talking about. It's also interesting to hear other people not in the Bitcoin bubble talk about Bitcoin because mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, <laughs> we're that early. <laughs> like people actually think that. Uh, so uh, it's it's interesting to hear that. And then there's always this one point where it's like, oh, Robin, you're working in Bitcoin. How is that? And then you are asked, then you have the attention uh, and then you can speak about it. And when, then you're sounding competent, then you're actually in a dialogue and then you actually maybe get someone to take the orange pill. Maybe that's the moment where someone is like, ah, never thought about that. Oh, that, that's an interesting point. Ah, I, will, I will look it up today. Like, oh, can you uh, give me some, some Bitcoin books about that? Or can you uh, recommend a podcast around that? So like, that, that's always the, the point how I try to do it. And I think the, the uh, defensive part is really cool. So that's why I, I really like um, uh, your way with the, with the games and with the books, not about Bitcoin. It's also interesting when, when someone asks me, oh, can you explain to me Bitcoin? And I'm asking, can you explain me inflation? <laughs> like th that's always the first uh, uh, question that I ask because then I know where they are in their journey. If, if they say like, yeah, inflation, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's bad that we have it. It's, it's a little bit high, but a little bit inflation is good. And uh, yeah, it's, it's probably caused by the war. Then I know, okay, I have, I, I, the first two hours I don't talk about Bitcoin. I talk about something completely else. So I, I love how, how you, uh, how you view it. Sorry from a, from a little rant here. Um, really, really cool. Thank you so much. Um, Uh, before we come to the end routine, there's always one question to ask all my guests uh, of my podcast. What can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Gosh, what can you learn from me? Um, I, I want to address the idea of the money mindset, actually, because I actually talked about this on um, some of the other podcasts that I've been on, which is... I think as Bitcoiners, especially for Bitcoin maxis, we get so enthusiastic about the potential of Bitcoin, what it can do to hum humanity and kind of reverse a lot of the bad stuff that have been developing over the last hundred years or so that we forget to realize that it is a tool. And for people who are hodling for the purpose of it going to the moon, you know, like we say that a lot, Bitcoin is going to go to the moon. We just have to remember that the feeling, the, I don't want to say the feeling, the mindset of money is the most important. And so I know some people who talk about how if they have holes in their socks, they're not going to buy new socks. They're going to save the money and put it into Bitcoin. And the question is, at what point is it okay to spend Bitcoin? Because money is a mindset in that if, you, if you're poor in fiat, You can also be poor hodling a lot of Bitcoin. 
And life is about your physical experience today because nobody has guarantee about tomorrow, right? So while we're talking about the hope in Bitcoin and that, um, you know, we, of course, want to use it as a storage of value and our goal eventually is that it is a mode of transaction, life today is still the most important. If that means, if you, if it means you stack less sats, but you get to take your kids on a fishing trip and you build that life experience, I feel like that is the way to go. And it probably a lot of Bitcoiners would disagree with me and be like, no, 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 you need to be hodling every dollar that you have. But I just want to remind everyone that, that, you still have to live today. Today, you you live in this physical space. You need to make the most of today and do what makes your heart sing. And yes, hodl, but that should not be the number one and all be all, unless that's what makes your heart sing. It's also interesting to say, I, I had, I think, a week ago or two weeks ago, the podcast uh, with Mark. Uh, he's, he's the guy that always has his Bitcoin talks in the pool on YouTube. He is a, like a small, uh, he's coming up now and he's, he has his podcast and is, is really a fun guy uh, to watch. And he basically has this concept of you should not die with all your t uh, toys. Like you should, uh, say, uh, you should collect memories and you should do yes. something with your life and you should not then uh hodl 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 and then die with all your bitcoin like that's that's maybe good if you want to give every all your wealth to your kids um but uh you should also experience life you should have fun with your kids uh, and make those memories with your kids while you're alive and not just give them a, lot, a bunch of money uh so uh that that concept is i think very very good and bitcoiners are getting very very aggressive when you tell them they can spend and sell their bitcoin at some points like there there are good ways of spending their bitcoin uh and uh it's 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 a funny because yeah it's this this hodl and never sell and always buy yeah what, what's the point of, of always buying and never selling like that 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 you, you should your life's goal should not be having as much bitcoin as possible Right. And there's a difference between money and wealth. And I just want to say as a parent of four grown kids, um, we've had many discussions over the years because I chose to homeschool and stay at home. And so if I had continued on in my investment banking journey, um, I think we'll be much more wealthy today, money wise, than, than what we actually, where we actually are. But if you ask the kids, the true wealth when you're growing up, is the attention that you get from your parents and the loving experiences that you go through, it will never be the fancy vacations or the trust fund that you can leave to them. That's not wealth. That's just money. So that's, that's my um, sort of my call to whoever's listening. <laughs> I, I love it so much, Tali. Yeah. It's uh, really cool. Uh, thank you so much. We have the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. And uh, sometimes I feel like uh, people have the feeling that I pick those questions out of a pool or something, but it's actually the, the previous guest asked actually that very question to you. How can you orange pill kids better? How can I orange pill kids better? I, I think that's actually the wrong question question to ask. I think there are three things that you need to focus on for the next generation. Um, I've, I've already talked about breadcrumbs of knowledge or just spotlighting what's happening in society and, and know that there is event, there is an alternative out there. But I think more important than that, if you look at the statistics of mental health in the next generation, um, I think that's the most, that's the more important question to ask. You can't orange pill a generation of kids if they are passively accepting what's handed to them. So that's again, okay, I'm going to go back to my books because that's, that's one of the topics that I really want to address, which is um, we have, we have a generation of kids that are being brought up where they're told First of all, we've already talked about the labels, but they're told that, especially in the, the public school or even the private school system, that um, 
you're supposed to stand in line, you're supposed to walk in line, you're supposed to raise your hand to ask a question, you have to ask for permission to go to the bathroom. So every, you, if you have an issue with a fellow classmate, you go to the teacher. You don't try to solve it. You go to the teacher, you go to the counselor, you go to the principal, you get, you get an adult to help you. That's, we say that a lot. Get an adult to help you. If you, if you get into a problem, you get an adult to help you. And what I'm seeing now, observing my friends, um, classmates is a generation of kids that just accept things as they are. Um, an example is, um, they were, my, my, uh, my kids' friends were sharing with me an experience over the summer where they are working as an event planner, uh, wait, wait staff. Um, and they were carrying out food and a grape rolled off a plate and fell onto the ground. And there were four of them. And they stood there and said, should we pick it up? It was a grape that fell on the ground that I guess my step on, but they asked that question first. And why? Is it because they feel like they're not allowed to? They shouldn't do anything that hasn't been asked? Or it doesn't matter. It's not their job. Like, what is the question, right? And so I feel like to Orange Pill kids, you need to first address their sense of self-value and their sense of self-empowerment so that they can grow up and ask questions of what is happening in the current system. Otherwise, you're telling them to believe one thing is just a race against somebody else telling them one thing first. Does that make sense? And so the early reader series focuses on empowering kids to look at themselves as capable people, capable of solving their own problems and looking for solutions to make a positive impact in other people's lives. And I think that actually is more of a key than just telling them about Bitcoin. I, I laugh that a lot. Don't give them the fish, learn them how to, how to uh, fish them themselves. Really, really cool. Uh, um, it has been a pleasure uh, talking with you, Tali. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people ask you questions and, and find more out about you? Yeah, so our website is freemarketkids.com. Um, from there, you can find me uh, with my women initiatives under orangehowder.com and my book series that's coming out. Uh, book one is out. Book two is almost ready to go out. That's under super hyphen K K A Y.com. But all of those in our, you know, our, um, Noster account, our telegram, all that stuff, they're all on the website. So go to free market kids and they'll kind of direct you to all these different places. Perfect. Thank you so much for taking the time. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye.